All right, we are recording now. Appreciate everyone being here. Uh, appreciate y'all coming and, and tuning in tonight. Um, hope everything's going well with school. Uh, tonight, uh, we are going to continue in Mark chapter 4. That's where we got to last week. We got to about verse 20. Uh, Mark 4, and so uh, we're going to continue talking about this. And you remember we talked about Mark's gospel is a gospel of action. Uh, Mark 4 is an interesting place because it's one of the few places that Mark will actually record parables. Uh, typically, Mark, when he records Jesus' life, uh, he doesn't speak of the parables, but he speaks of um, the actions, the miracles, the things that Jesus has done. And so this is where this is so interesting is that this is one of the times when Mark records that. Now, Matthew and Luke and John, uh, more Matthew and Luke will record a lot of these parables, uh, whereas uh, John records a few, but not many, but Mark's the least of all of them. Uh, so it's very significant Mark records these. Now, you remember last week we talked about the sower, uh, where Jesus told about a sower who went out to sow, and he threw the seed out in the various places. And then as he threw that seed out, that seed fell on certain places in certain areas, uh, and it was fruitful and multiplied. Uh, and we talked about how important that was. And we talked about how at the end of that, in about verses 18, 19, 20, Jesus begins to speak to his apostles, and he begins, well, before that, uh, he begins to tell them what it means. Uh, he speaks to his apostles and his close disciples and tells them uh, what they need to know, what they are, or what's important for them to know, to be able to understand this parable. Uh, and just, they asked, why did Jesus speak in parables? And he told them uh, that he, speak, he spoke this way because certain people were going to understand it and certain people were not. Uh, those who had been given the knowledge and who were wanting the knowledge will be able to find it. Uh, and those who are not interested in it, they will not be able to find it. And that's what we're going to see tonight, that continued thought. Uh, so we're going to go back into Mark chapter 4, uh, and we're going to look at what he talks about. He begins next to say, and he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed, and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. Uh, come to light, excuse me. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. So Jesus begins, he speaks to them. Again, uh, he's speaking to his apostles, the apostles and those close disciples who have come to him, uh, who have asked him about what his, what his parables mean, the ones who are really dedicated to him. And, and he begins to ask about uh, their, their heart, actually their life. Uh, he asked this simple question. Uh, if you go back a few verses earlier, he, would have, he was talking to them uh, about their heart and about um, what they would need to do or what, how they, should, uh, how they uh, should have that open heart, excuse me, uh, and how they need to be ones that are listening and willing to accept the truth. Now he continues that thought uh, about what to do. Uh, and that is that this is, a, uh, this is one who he hears, and when he hears, uh, the, the word he hears is productive. Uh, notice, and he said to them, as a lamp brought, them, uh, again, brought in to be put under a basket. Uh, you know, we sing that song, uh, this little light of mine. This is Luke Mark's version of that. Now, Matthew will give this in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Mark gives this another time. And, and again, the idea is that, that some people will say, oh, well, well, who got it right? Did Jesus teach it here to at Mark's setting, or did he teach it in Matthew's? Well, uh, Jesus probably taught this many times. Again, he traveled all throughout his country, all throughout his nation. Uh, he spoke to many different people. And if you've ever heard preachers, and you've ever visited preachers who travel, uh, they like to have the same sermons. They teach the same things because what they teach is valuable. It's important. Uh, and so that's sort of what we see here with, with, with Jesus. We'd assume he would do very similar things. Uh, so it's not unusual for these different gospels to record a very similar teaching. Uh, but I said, man, go, we see the song, this is a lot of mine. Uh, and he says, again, is a lamp brought un into the house? Do you light a candle and then put a basket over it? Or do you hide it under the bed? Now, again, you got to remember on their life, in, in their time, uh, their house would have been probably the size of our bedrooms, uh, if not a little smaller than that. Most houses, uh, most houses were one room. Uh, they had a, a little spot for a kitchen, a little spot where they would sit, and a little spot where they would go to bed. Uh, they didn't have very much to it, and so what they would do is they'd take these little lamps, these little, little clay lamps, and they would light it, and they would have a shelf, uh, almost like a 
like a shelf that would be mounted on the ceiling pretty high. And they would light this candle or light this lamp and they would put it up on the shelf and it would give light to the whole house. And so Jesus says, you buy a lot, you get that lot to show it, not to hide it, not to cover it up. And then he tells next that uh, nothing is hidden. Uh, nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. And again, he's speaking of his parables about what Jesus is doing is that his people are going to be a lot. Uh, his people are going to be a lamp. And the idea of a lamp, and this is throughout the Bible, the idea of a lamp is that this is a lamp that shines uh, and for everyone to see, uh, but the lamp does not, um, does not necessarily give its own light, but it... Um, it gives a lot of something else. And that's sort of what us as Christians are. We're to be lights and we're to reflect the light of Christ. And so here he says, he's talking to his believers, that they're going to be a light. And then he's going to say that, that, that what they show is not something that's hidden. Uh, that nothing is hidden except we may manifest. It is going to come manifest to all people. And, and sort of the idea here is that Jesus is telling his apostles that they are understanding something, they're seeing something before anybody else does. Before any other body, any other person hears this message, understands it, they're going to be the ones who are there at ground level, if you will. Uh, they're going to be there at the start. And he says, nothing is secret, nothing is hidden except what's going to come to light. And then you know, notice he says, verse 23, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Uh, the idea there is that uh, anybody can hear this message, anybody can uh, listen to this message, anybody can respond to this message. Uh, it's the hearer's responsibility. Uh, this is, again, not teaching, as some people may say, that, that uh, God will put this on you, or you've got to, uh, or, or God will make this decision for you, or enlighten you, or give you some special information. Oh, he's just telling us that what's going to happen is what we do with it. Uh, we all have ears. He says, if you have ears to hear, and again, the idea is ears to hear. Mary, he talked earlier in Mark 4 about those who had ears to hear, but they didn't perceive. They heard his word, but they didn't accept it. They didn't listen to it. They didn't obey it. And here he says, let the one who has ears to hear, hear, and let him not just hear words, but let him understand it. And then if he understands it, it will be a light that shines to other people, and then that light will do something else. Uh, you notice the next part, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, we measure to you, and more will be, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given, and for the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So what Jesus says next is to pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to what people say. Pay attention uh, not to the latest gossip, not to the latest music, but pay attention to the teachings of the Bible. Pay attention to what you hear, and then use that. Uh, this is something for all of us. This is something that, that is very interesting and very uh, telling about the Bible uh, is that it's something we need to constantly listen to, constantly hear, because we're constantly learning. Uh, one thing I've heard, and I've learned this in my life, I know most of y'all are, are still in young teenage life, but I've known this from people, and we even had the elders and deacons meeting their day, and we, they made the same comment I've always heard. Uh, we were talking about the different Bible studies we've been having, and uh, one of them said, well, it's always good to go back and read it, because every time you read it, you see something new. Every time you hear it, you hear something new. And this is sort of what Jesus is saying. You, you pay attention to what you hear. Pay attention to the Bible, and the more you use it, the more you measure it out, the more we measure to you. Basically, you're never going to figure out, you're never going to read the Bible, and one day you're going to read the Bible and put it down and say, I'm done. I know everything there is to know about God. I know everything there is to know about salvation. I know everything there is to know about Christ. I know everything there is to know. I'm finished. I'm putting the Bible down and never pick it up again. You will never reach that point. You can never reach that point. Because every time we read it, every time we study it, we're going to find a new idea, a new thought, a new application, and it's going to make us grow. It's going to make our light stronger. And then you notice what Jesus says, for the one who has been given or the one who has, more will be given. The idea is he's not going to take it away. As long as you grow, as long as you study, as long as you uh, read it and try to know the truth. And again, remember, these are these people who are here trying to find the truth from Jesus. As long as you're seeking to know the truth, it'll keep being added to you. But then notice the flip side. He said, but the one who has not, the one who's heard it and accepted it maybe and, and accepted it a little bit, but wasn't fully invested in it, even what he has will be taken away. Uh, this is sort of uh, very similar to some of the parables we've read. Uh, or we, we see other places, excuse me. Uh, the parables uh, of like the man, well, the, the three talent men. 
Uh, the man of five talents, three talents, and one talent. You know, that's a, that's a, a parable that we sometimes don't like. And, and even we preached that, I preached that here just uh, last year. Uh, and I had people coming up and saying, well, I don't understand that parable. I don't, I don't, uh, why did God say it that way? Talking about the one talent man where he had the talent, uh, he hid it, he didn't use it. But when it was time to pay back, the owner or master called him out for it. And then he takes that one talent and gives it to somebody else. And we say, well, well, he had the one talent. That was good enough, wasn't it? Well, it's not. The idea is we have to take what we have and use it. We have to provide with it, and we have to use what we're going to see next. And this, this leads into the next parable that Jesus talks about, beginning in verse 26, where he talks again about a man who goes out to plow, who goes out in the field. Uh, notice verse 26, and he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises day and night, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself, first a blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. Um, but when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. You see, Jesus talks about, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a field. You no, know, he talked earlier about stolen seed. Well, that seed was a good word. This is a different type, or this same seed, but a different kind of result. Notice what he says, that, that men throughout history, throughout all history, men have been farming. And men have farmed throughout all the ages, throughout all the years, throughout all the time. And even with our high-tech, advanced society, we still do not understand exactly how plants grow. Yes, we understand the process. We understand that, that seed gets planted in the ground. We understand that seed dies. And we understand that seed produces a new life and that seed grows into a weed or into a new plant. And we study all that. But we don't know how that seed goes from something that's buried and dies to become something new. Scientists have tried and tried and tried. They have tried to copy a plant. They have tried to make their own seed, to make their own copy of the plants that God has made, but they cannot make a plant, a seed that you bury in the ground and new life comes from it because it's gone. And this is what Jesus tells us. The plant, we have a seed, the way it works, man's not going to know. Just as majority of this stuff, you know, we, we are, are, you study your science classes, you go to these classes, and they tell you all the stuff we know, all these theories, all these ideas, all these proofs. There's still a lot of things we don't know. There are a lot of things we don't understand. And this is what Jesus says. He says it's like the seed. He said a man throws a seed, then that man goes about his life. He goes about, he sleeps, and he rises night and day. He sleeps day and night. Uh, he goes to bed. He gets up in the morning. There's nothing he can do with that seed. He doesn't go out and dig that seed up and crack that seed open or make it grow or make it come to life. No, he just lets the seed go. And eventually that seed's going to sprout. And that seed is going to sprout. Notice what he says. The earth produces by itself. Uh, in itself, the earth produces that seed. And that seed produces first a blade of grass, that blade that comes up through the dirt. Uh, you may remember uh, in elementary school, I'm sure you've all done this, man, done this in Bible school, uh, where you plant a seed. You plant that seed and you watch it, and you watch it, and you watch it, and you watch it. And then you get all excited because you've got this little big cup of dirt that you've buried a seed in, but you haven't seen anything yet. And then all of a sudden, one day, there's that little stem, that little green leaf that pops up out of that dirt. And how excited you were. I remember, in, I remember in, in school when we did that. Uh, I remember we had a, some of us, we were, we were racing every day uh, to see whose plant will be the first one to sprout up through the ground. And just as that's natural, that's what's going to happen. There's nothing that we can do in science class to make it quicker. Nothing we can do to make it change. But that's what happens in nature. And he says it grows into the blade, then the ear, then the gear gets full of corn or full of grain. And this is a wheat, wheat seed, most likely. Uh, this is the seed uh, that would grow and produce. And then you notice verse 29, but when the grain is ripe, we go back to the man. Now remember, the man has done nothing but plant the seed. And then when the time is ripe, the man knows when to put the sickle because the harvest has come. You see, the analogy here, the, the parallel here, is that Jesus is speaking about God's Word. There are going to be times we're going to let our light shine. We're going to speak to people. We're going to tell people about God, and we're going to not see immediate results. We're not going to see immediate change in certain people, but we've got to let the seed grow. We've got to give it time. We cannot rush it. 
We cannot make it rush or cannot make it go faster, slower than what we want. But one day when the time is right, it's going to produce, it's going to grow, it's going to develop. Uh, the same is true of our faith. We may try to develop faith, try to push our faith, but our faith and all the things that come from God are going to come in time. We don't know exactly how they work. There's there no, no layout, no plan of, oh, well, if you do this and this and this, you'll increase your faithfulness. No. All you've got to do is keep doing what God has called you to do. Keep doing what God tells you to do. And as you go, you'll see after, you'll see the results of what God has done. You'll see your faithfulness grow. You'll see that, that friend that you thought would never believe the gospel, that gospel works on them. And you'll see that sprout begin to pop up. And so Jesus tells them to know uh, about this, uh, to, to realize that God is in control, that God is taking care of them, uh, and God is watching over them. <clears throat> so we go to our next verse, um, and Jesus again tells this parable. Now, some people wonder here, and, and there's a, a good thought here, that maybe this is not to these disciples. Because remember, he used the parables more when he was out in the, in the public. Uh, and, but we really don't know if this was just to the apostles and the disciples or if this was to uh, another crowd. Uh, in Matthew's account, he preaches this to a crowd. In Luke's account, he preaches this to a crowd. Uh, and so some people think that Mark probably he preached, he preached it to a crowd, but he also preached it in, in private as well. And that was what he says, verse 30. And with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that birds of the air can make nests in its shade. You see, he gives us what we call the parable of the mustard seed. He talks about the kingdom of God. This is the church. He says, this is what the church is going to be like. He said, this is how the church and everywhere it's been and everywhere it goes, this is how it's going to be. He says, like a grain of mustard seed. Now, a mustard seed is a very, very small uh, seed. Now, when Jesus says it's the smallest of all the seeds on the earth, he doesn't necessarily mean it's the smallest seed there is. There are some seeds that are smaller than a mustard seed. There are seeds in Israel that are smaller than a mustard seed. But they're wild seeds. They're weed seeds. The mustard seed was the smallest seed that Israelites would plant. And this is a very, very small seed that they would use. And they would take this very, very small seed and they'd put it in the ground. And they would know this mustard seed. The mustard seed was, was well known in their area uh, because they had planted. Again, they had planted and they'd watch it grow. But when it grows, it becomes the largest of all the plants, uh, the garden plants. It's the largest of all the herbs. It's an herb that grows. Um, uh, I've seen pictures of these mustard seeds, and we showed them at church on uh, some of our lessons, um, where these mustard seeds will grow up to be 10, 15 tall, 10 to 15 foot tall stalks, uh, and they will have these big branches. Uh, again, they have not branches like a tree, but they have branches enough that will support a bird. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about this little bitty seed that produces this great big stalk with these branches that's able to support life, that's able to give the birds a home. And all this, he says, is saying to the kingdom of God. Well, how is it like the kingdom of God? Well, how did the kingdom of God start? The kingdom of God started very small. In the book of Acts, I think Eddie's been studying the book of Acts with y'all before all this hit. Uh, the book of Acts will talk about the beginning of the kingdom, uh, the beginning of the church. You know, it started first with 120 people. Then Peter got up the day of Pentecost and preached. And there was uh, 3,000 people believed that day. Within a few day, within a few chapters of that uh, Acts two, uh, you see five thousand Christians listed. Then you see myriads of myriads of Christians, so it's thousands of thousands, and, and, and most believe that's ten thousands of ten thousands. The church took off, uh, and what we see here, and that's throughout the world, is the church was like that mustard seed, a very small, humble beginning but it grew into something significant. It grew into something major. It grew into something amazing. And that's the idea of the church. The church is something that smart, starts small, but it's going to grow into something bigger, very similar to our faith. Our faith will do the same thing. 
Uh, and again, these are things that are not what we want, not what we think, not what we do, but these are things that God does. The things that God makes sure, makes sure accomplishes according to his will and according to his word. And so Jesus warns the people here. He tells them that the, 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 the kingdom of God, the church, uh, as we know it, is going to be like a, a mustard seed. And then we see the next verse, uh, verse 33 and 34. Uh, with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So as he spoke to the crowds, and this is why we say we think he spoke back to a crowd setting, although it's not told, uh, is he says here again, his such parables, he spoke words to them as they were able to hear it. Again, he spoke to them so they'd understand it. There are certain things about the church, certain things about Christ's life, about Christ's plan, Christ's uh, goal that were not uh, spoken, that, that we're not able to understand. Again, we look back at it and we say, well, well how can they not understand it? How do they not believe Christ was going to die? How do they not believe he was going to come back? How do they not believe he was going to do all the things they say he was going to do? They'd never heard of that before. That was unreal to them. There was no way they could comprehend it. And so Jesus spoke, and that's the apostles. Jesus spoke to the crowd as they could understand it. If he would have said, I've got a kingdom coming after this, they wouldn't have understood the kingdom of being a spiritual kingdom. You see, they were expecting a physical kingdom, a kingdom that would go against Rome, a kingdom that would fight Rome and overcome Rome. But Jesus had to speak to them about the church in such a way about what his plan was, his kingdom was, so they could understand, so they could later in life go back and think about, hey, you remember that story Jesus told? I think it explains this. And they will go back and say, hey, well, well, this is what the mustard seed meant. Or this is what the soils meant. And they could grow and develop. And again, notice, he did not speak to the, them, the crowds, without a parable. But privately to his own disciples. These are the apostles and those closest to him. Uh, these are ones he explained everything to. He told them about what these parables meant. Again, even them, even with them, he could not explain every single detail, every single little thing, because uh, they wouldn't understand it either. But he explained it to them in a way they could. And so here we see Jesus being described here as the ultimate teacher, uh, the teacher that knows where his students are. He doesn't try to overwhelm his students, but instead he teaches them what they need to know and how they need to know it so they can be the best students, they can be the best disciples they can be. And so from here, we go to the last few verses of uh, chapter 4 of Mark. In Mark 4, beginning in verse 35, Mark changes. Now, remember I told you, Mark is a gospel of action. The parables were a little insert. Now he's going back to stories. He's going to tell us about three or four stories about Jesus' power over things. He's going to talk about Jesus' power over, over nature, over demons, uh, over disease, and I believe we're going to see chapter 5, he's going to show the power over death. Uh, so we'll see that uh, probably next week or see some of that next week. I don't know how far we'll get. Uh, but we're going to look here at Jesus' power over nature. Uh, this is a story that's very familiar with us. It's one of the stories that all the or most of the gospel writers tell us about, uh, and that is uh, this story in beginning verse 35. Now, on that day, after he's preached the, ter he preached the parables and told the disciples what it meant. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let's go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took, with him, uh, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? You see, Jesus goes here to, to tell us the famous story of the calming the storm. You know, Jesus and his disciples are going, uh, they've been preaching. Remember, he's always preaching on the seaside because seaside carries the sounds better uh, and, the, and, the, and the shore carries the sound up the side. And he's preaching to them. And as he's teaching and preaching and healing, probably, uh, he gets ready when night's come, the evening's come. He says, let's go across the other side. Uh, we're going to go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. 
And this is what Jesus would do. There, Mark tells us about four trips, I believe it is, of where Jesus goes from one side of the sea to the other. And he says, let's go aside to the other. Let's go across the other side. And then they leave the crowd behind them, and they get in the boat. Now, remember, he's got at least four experienced fishermen. Fishermen who have fished to see a guy leave probably their entire life. They know this sea like the back of their hands. They know the weather. And this is what happens. A great windstorm grows. A uh, great storm. What happens in the Sea of Galilee is that there's, there's parts of it, that there's mountains and hills above the Sea of Galilee, and winds will come down through the hills and through valleys that they go into the sea, uh, and they'll bring in cold air. And when the cold air of the mountains blows in and the, it hits the warm air of the Sea of Galilee, it creates a violent storm. Uh, Galilee was known for its violent storms that appear almost out of anywhere. And so this is what happens. A great storm breaks. A terrible storm uh, takes off. Uh, and it's so bad that the, the waves are breaking into the side. Uh, they're splashing over the side and begin filling the boat. Uh, a terrifying situation. Uh, and again, they're splashing and covering the boat so much that the boat begins to fill. And the disciples are afraid that what's going to happen is that the boat's going to fill with water and the boat's going to sink. Uh, and, and here they are worried about what's going to happen. And, and you know it's not calm or you know it's not easy. You know that boat's rocking and, and having a fit. And they look over at Jesus. And what is he doing? He's over there asleep. Uh, he, 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 they're amazed that Jesus is sleeping. Now, why was he asleep? Well, he's asleep because he's worked so hard. You, you've ever been in one of those situations where you can, people say, you can, I can sleep through anything? That's where Jesus was. He was so tired. He was so exhausted. He was so not worried about the storm that it didn't bother him. Uh, he could sleep through the storm. Uh, I don't know how you are now, but I remember when I was younger, uh, there would be storms coming by, and I would, what bothered me? I would go to sleep, and I wouldn't have any fear of them because I knew I was taken care of. I knew my parents were watching. If something happened, they'll wake me up, and we'll have to go do whatever we got to do, uh, and everything will be fine. Uh, as I've gotten older, I've had to, to learn to be wary of storms with two kids of my own. Uh, I've learned that I have to watch the weather. I have to see what's going to happen. I have to pay attention to what's going on uh, because I want to make sure they're protected. Uh, and I say that to, to give you the illustration that there's some nights that if it's a storm, uh, it'll be late before I can go to bed because I'll have to watch the storm and see where it's going because uh, I can't sleep during a storm because I want to make sure I know what's happening. Uh, the only way I could sleep is if I knew someone was watching it for me. And you see, that's what Jesus is doing here. Jesus is able to sleep because he knows who holds that storm. He knows that God is in control and that he is God's man, and he knows through his divine knowledge uh, what's going to happen. He's our total disciples. We're going to the other side. Uh, every time Jesus says something was going to happen, it happened. Uh, so Jesus knew, uh, he knew this storm was coming from all indications, and he's still in sleep. And the disciples are so fretful over this, so worried about it, they go and wake him up, uh, and they call him teacher, rabbi. Do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that the storm is raging? Do you not care that the boat is filling with water and you're just going to sit here and sleep? And the idea of him sleeping on a cushion, that the, the word cushion can also be headrest, uh, meaning that all Jesus had was some kind of uh, padding uh, that he found on the side of the boat that he sort of laid his head against and, and went to sleep. And again, some people say this is a sign of how exhausted Jesus is. And they come and they ask him, Master, are you not afraid? Teacher, uh, don't you care we're about to go down? Are you just going to sleep while we sink? And he knows verse 39, he woke up. He wakes up. And he does something amazing. Now, he wakes up. He stands up in this boat. I don't know if you've ever been caught out in a bad storm, but, but if you get caught in a real bad storm with bad winds, it's very hard to try to stand up. But imagine being in a boat, a boat that's rocking, that's tossing, that the waves are crashing over it, that, that's rougher than, than probably anything we've ever been experienced with. And Jesus stands up in the midst of that. And he stands up in the wind and he rebukes the wind. And then he says, to the, and then he talks to the sea. He cries out, peace, be still. And everything stops. It immediately becomes calm. The wind quits. The water quits. I, I've often read this story, and I, I've, I'm like you. I've heard this story my whole life growing up in church. 
But when you stop and think about this story, the true implication of the story, this is an amazing feat. This is Jesus proving who he was. Because there's nobody, nobody in all history, nobody we ever know, nobody will ever know or will ever see that can stand outside when the winds are blowing and say, peace be still, and they stop. That's one of the miracles nobody's tried to copy because you can't, because the wind will prove your faults. The wind will prove how wrong you are because it won't stop. But Jesus stands up and says, peace be still. And the wind stops and the water goes calm. It goes from the rough, ragged waves to peaceful. And again, the, the idea is still water. Uh, the idea of the calm of the Sea of Galilee, uh, you would get in spots and it would just be flat like glass. And that's the, the image here of the great calm. And then he looks at his disciples. He says, why are you so afraid? Why are you so worried? Have you still no faith? Don't you have faith of who I am? Don't you have faith uh, of what I can do? Don't you have faith in my mission to God? And that's sort of what Jesus is telling him. Don't you know that God's going to look after us? God's going to take care of us until the mission is done? Don't you have faith? And again, sometimes we look at those statements. We say, oh, the disciples should have had faith. They should have done this. They should have no, they're, they're us. We would be in the same spot. These were not supermen. These were not uh, super spiritual men, super saints or anything like that. These were regular men who left their common life and were following Jesus. And when they followed Jesus, they were amazed at what he did. And you notice verse 41, they are filled with great fear. Great fear, great awe. Not they were afraid of Jesus and that they were afraid that he's going to turn on them and, and do something to them. But they were in awe. They were amazed at what Jesus could do. And they looked to one another and they said, who is, then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? They asked each other, who are we following? Who are we traveling around with? You know, he's a great teacher. He can do these miracles. But here he went above and beyond the miracles in that even nature itself listens to him. What this does, this has a very important point, very important idea. This is something, again, no one else can copy. No one else has ever copied and has ever been able to do besides Jesus. And that's only because there's only one person who can control the wind. There's only one person who can control the forces of nature. There's only one person who can control this world, and that's his maker. And when Jesus stands up and tells the wind, peace be still, he is proving to his apostles, he is proving to his disciples that he is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh, God here now to look after them, to care for them, and to watch over them. Jesus proves who he is. And this is Mark's point. Mark's trying to prove to his audience that Jesus is the Son of God. And there's no better way to prove that than to show that he's the God of nature. The winds and the waves obey him. And you know, we can learn something from this. We, we learn something from Mark 4, and we're about done. In Mark 4, we can learn a few lessons. Number one, we learn that we need to be like that light and that seed. We need to realize that the word of God is that seed that is planted within us. And that seed needs to be taken care of. That seed needs to be nurtured. But that seed on its own will grow. If we'll work with it, we'll take care of it, we'll measure it out, we'll read it, we'll study it, our seed will grow. Our plant will grow, and that plant will grow and be, produ uh, be uh, productive. It will create great things if we'll let it. And then we need to let that light shine. And that light shines to those around us. That light shines for people to see. People need to see something in you. All of you who watch this, people around you need to see that you're something different. They need to see that you're something special. You're not going to do like they do because that's going to make them ask why. Why are you not like us? And then when they ask the why, then you can tell them why. You can tell them, well, I'm a Christian, and I believe it, and I'll obey it. And then you never know because when you do that, then you plant a seed. You show them that being a Christian means something different. Being a Christian means not being like everyone else, not fitting in with this world. And you plant a seed that one day, 
one day may grow into a great plan. Into a plan that will grow and be a faithful Christian itself. The second lesson we can learn from these last few verses, and that is that God is the God of all things. God is the God of all. God is the God of this world. There are so many proofs of God that we can take a class and we can talk about it. I, I can show you over and over again how we can know that God is God. And if God is God and God is the, the one who rules this world and God is the one who's in charge of this world, then we need to be on his side. We need to be with him, serving him, obeying him, following him. Because if God is the God of this world, then God is the God, the only God, who can protect us, who can save us from this world. That's what we can learn tonight. That we need to realize that God is the God of all creation, the God of all the world, the God who will save us if we'll turn to him, if we'll follow him, if we'll obey him. I appreciate you being with us tonight. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, we will pick back up here in Mark chapter 5 uh, next week. Uh, again, we're going to start at 7.30 next week. Uh, but for now, I appreciate everyone being here. I look forward to seeing you all soon. Uh, but we are going to stop for tonight. Hope you have a good week. Hope you have a good rest of the week. I uh, hope everything goes well for you. And again, we'll see you all hopefully very soon. Thank you.